Um, is everybody excited? Yeah, energy, thank you, here we go. Will Richardson is one of the pioneers of classroom blogging. As far back as 2002, while blogging with his American literature class, he tapped into one of the great promises of technology and education, where its use enables students to learn something where without the technology, that learning would not otherwise be possible. His first book, Blogs, Wikis, Podcasts, and Other Powerful Web Tools for Classrooms, is not only a mouthful, it's in every one of your school's resource libraries. I encourage you to check it out. His other three books are an equally compelling and rewarding read for any educator. Will is also a parent of two teenagers and has spent the last dozen years developing an international reputation as a leading thinker and writer about the intersection of social online learning networks and education. He is my first inspiration in the field of education technology, and I hope he inspires you today in a similar way. I'm thrilled to introduce us as an entire district to Will Richardson. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Um, I'm looking a little dressed down today. Uh, yesterday when I was leaving New Jersey where I live, uh, I don't know if you saw the weather, but it was really brutal around Philly yesterday. A lot of ice, a lot of uh, snow and everything else. And I was looking out the window trying to think of when I should leave. Should I leave early, late, whatever else. So finally I just got in the car and I drove. Got all the way here, got to my hotel, looked around in my car. I'd left my suitcase at home. So. Uh, luckily, there was a Macy's across the street, so you're seeing Macy's latest, uh, latest garb here. You got this, Chris? All right, thanks very much. So it's, uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be here with you today um, and to spend a little bit of time giving you a little bit of a sense of what the world looks like from my viewpoint. Uh, it's a little bit of a different view probably than uh, many of you have. I don't know if, uh, uh, if you mentioned it earlier, but I was a public school educator for 22 years before I started doing this about eight years ago and I taught English and I uh, was a technology administrator. My worldview around schools has really changed over the last eight years and a lot of it is because of technology. So what I'm going to try to do today is give you a little bit of a different context, a different, little bit of a different lens to look at the world through when it comes to learning and when it comes to your work. And Hopefully, it'll inspire you in a lot of ways, but I'm also going to try to push your thinking, and uh, uh, hopefully you'll walk out of here with uh, a little bit of a different sense of what the world looks like. I'm going to give you a lot of slides and a lot of stuff. If you're interested in getting this slide deck, I'd be more than happy to do that. In fact, I'll share it with the folks here, but I've got a whole bunch of other resources, about 50 other links that you can pursue, you can read, you can kind of go back and look at if you want to go more deeply into the things I'm going to talk about. If you're interested in that, just send me a quick email at more at willrichardson.com. This is not an autoresponder, so I'll get this back to you in a couple days or so. But uh, feel free to do that at any time, and uh, like I said, you'll get a whole bunch of stuff that'll keep you busy through the rest of the winter if you, if you want to do that. And I was going to put, uh, I was going to correct this. It is Levo Tech, not Mount Lebanon. I kind of put that as a placeholder and uh, forgot to ask what it was going to be. So if you want to tweet, how many of you might be tweeting today as we go through this session? Okay, so about a dozen of you. So I don't have to be too careful today what I say, but um, if you want to get out your phones, if you want to get out your technology, if you want to um, look up some of the stuff that I'm talking about, please feel free to do that. It doesn't bother me. Um, in fact, if that helps you deepen the experience, more power. So this may be one of my most difficult presentations in a while because of who you are. And you know, the question that I know many of you are probably asking is, well, why should we change? You have, from what I understand, one of the most successful districts probably in the state according to traditional metrics. You send most of your kids to school, to college, they are successful in college and universities. Your parents are happy. State legislatures, I'm sure, legislators, are, I'm sure, are happy um, with the work that you're doing. And, and from every appearance, uh, this is a high-performing district. And you should be congratulated on that, by the way. Um, that is a wonderful thing. In fact, give yourselves uh, a round of applause. Um, and I'm not here in any way to suggest that the work that you're doing is not great for kids. That is not what I'm going to do. But I am here to challenge some of the assumptions that you work under. Because I think in education right now, that's a good thing to do. Whether that challenge leads you to change anything, I don't know. I'm going to get in my car without my bag and drive home again tonight um, and get my clothes and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, that's going to be up to you. 
But I'm going to encourage you to really think deeply about some of the stuff that I present today. But again, what you do about that is going to be up to you. And this is hard for you too. It's not just hard for me to convince you to think differently, but it's hard work if you choose to think differently about the work that you do. I love this quote from Dana Boyd. One of the things I think we as adults are going to have to do, and I agree with her, especially in education, is we're going to have to separate our work from our nostalgia around what schools have looked like for 125 years, what our own experience in school has been, and also we're going to have to set aside our fears because a lot of this technology stuff, specifically with the web, is scary. It's really different. There are bad things about the web. I'm not here to tell you that the web is this 100% you know, wonderful place. It's not. There are lots of complexities in the ways in which the internet works, our interactions with the internet, which by the way is one of the reasons we have to change what we do. Because of those complexities and interactions that our kids are undertaking right now, and that our kids are going to undertake as they become adults, they need our help in figuring out what they should be sharing, what they shouldn't be sharing, all those things about privacy, about, about safety, about all those other things that go along with the interactions they're going to have. And, you know, as, as Chris mentioned, I have two teenagers. I'm fully convinced that my kids are going to be immersed in the web the rest of their, at least the rest of their lives in the short term. Who knows what the next technology is? I don't know. But in the short term, it's going to be a big part of their lives. The other part of it is it can be confusing. And look, you know what? You should be confused right now. You better be confused right now. If you're not feeling confused right now about learning and education, I'm going to respectfully suggest to you that you're not paying attention. Because there are huge things happening in a learning context now that challenge directly the assumptions that we make about school and the assumptions that we make about our own practice. And so I'm going to try to make you confused today. You may not have heard speaker say that to you before. I'm going to try to make you confused. I'm going to also try to make you uncomfortable. But hopefully at the end of this, you'll feel inspired as well. Because this is an amazing, amazing time to be a learner. If you are a learner now and you have access, and most of the kids in your district do have regular access, if you know how to use that access to learn, it's a pretty amazing time. So let's start there. Sometimes I think this whole learning thing, we complicate it too much, right? I mean, I don't know how many sessions or how many you know, times you've talked about this stuff. We could probably add to this list. There are probably 10 or 12 others that go up there. Um, basically, uh, the, we, we seem to have this fetish almost with, with modifying the noun these days. You can't have just learning. But it is just learning. You either learn something or you don't. It doesn't matter how you learn it. What matters is, did you learn it? Does it have value to you? If you did that in a blended way, if you did that in a collaborative way, a 21st century way, it doesn't really matter. What matters is, what sticks in your learning? What sticks in our kids' learning? So I think this is a great question to start with. What do you mean by learning? When we say learning something, what does that mean? And I want you to take about a minute right now to turn to someone next to you and define learning. Go ahead. Should be easy, right? Go ahead. Do it. All right. <clears throat> so I know that we could probably spend a lot more time talking about that, but just raise your hand if you found that to be an easy question to answer. OK, about 10 of you. The rest of you struggle with it. I struggle with it. There are a lot of definitions of what learning is. I want to shout, let's take a couple of them. What'd you come up with? What's one, one definition someone had that was pretty, came pretty quickly? Just shout it out. Developing skills. Developing skills? OK, and what's another one? One more? Okay, having an open mind to accept new ideas. And I bet if we spent another five, ten minutes, we'd probably come up with 20, 25, 30 other phrases like that that kind of describe learning. So my point here is, is that this is not easy. It's not an easy question to answer sometimes. But it is the focus. This is the starting point for everything that we do in schools, isn't it? We want kids to learn. So we have to have some understanding of what learning is. Now, 
I don't know if this is the best definition, but this is Saracen's definition. That, that, that um, question, by the way, this is a book from a guy named Seymour Saracen. Um, that's, the, that's the title of the book. It's a great read, by the way. It's about uh, 15 years old, a little dense, but he talks about this as the definition of, of learning. Productive learning is where the process engenders and reinforces wanting to learn more. Absent wanting to learn more, the learning is unproductive. Now, think about that for one second in your own learning experience. Your own, forget about your kids and forget about classrooms. In your own learning experience. The things that you have learned most deeply and most, most powerfully in your own lives are absolutely the things you wanted to learn more about. Whether it's the Packers, too bad. Whether it's literature, whether it's business, finance, entrepreneur, whatever it is, the things that you have learned most deeply, the things that you have expertise in are the things that you wanted to learn more about. At the end of the day, you didn't just stop at the end of the class, you went out and learned more about it. Okay? So my problem as a parent of two teenagers is this. My kids come home from school in large measure not wanting to learn more about the things that they're being exposed to in school. That's a problem. It's especially a problem now, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to hope that we can agree that the fundamental idea of that definition works, that learning is about learning more. I mean, we can debate it on the edges, but I think we can agree that the learning piece that's most important is the stuff we want to learn more about. Then the question becomes, well, how do we help kids learn more productively at school, right? Because we all want kids to be productive learners. We all want the learning interactions that happen in our classrooms to be productive. We want kids to be engaged. We want kids to learn more. Now, how do we do that then? Well, so here's an interesting quote from Einstein that I think resonates around this conversation. Einstein said, I never teach. I never teach. All I do is create the conditions under which my kids can learn. I only try to make space for kids to learn within the context of the curriculum, within the context of what we're doing in the classroom. But I never really teach as much as create those conditions. So here's the next thing I want you to talk about real fast. So what are those conditions? What do kids need? What do you need in order to learn powerfully and deeply about anything that you want to learn about? What are the conditions that need to exist? Go ahead and take a minute to talk about those. Go ahead. All right, whoa, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so again, we could spend some more time on this, obviously, but since we're under some time constraints, um, let me hear five things. What are five conditions that are required for people to learn? Just shout them out, what's one? Relevance. Time. time. Freedom from distraction. What was the one over here? Passion. Passion. One more. Safe. Feeling, safe. Feeling safe. Okay. I predicted what you were going to say. <laughs> now, I'm sure that some of your discussions probably aren't on this list, but I'm betting that most of the things that you said you can find on this list somewhere. And the reason that they're on this list is not because of my brilliance, it's because of your brilliance. These are the collected responses pretty much. I've been asking this question of teachers now for a couple of years. I bet you over 10,000 teachers have informed this list. Okay, so this isn't rocket science. The conditions for learning, we know this for two reasons, right? You guys know this for two reasons. Number one, because you're educators, because you have some context, you have some expertise in, uh, in learning, at least I hope you have some expertise in learning. But the second reason that you know this is because you're learners. You guys are learners. These are the conditions required for you to learn, right? Pretty much when you learn things powerfully and deeply, that's what happens. Okay, so you can guess what the next question is, right? Which of those currently describe our classrooms? Which of these conditions currently exist generally in our classrooms? Now, you may be an outlier, but in most classrooms, in most schools that I go, people struggle with this when I ask that question. When they think about the learning experiences that kids are having in schools, not so many of these show up. Certainly, you are constrained by time. You are constrained by curriculum. You are constrained by state expectations. There's a lot of things up here that we'd love to be able to create in terms of the conditions, but 
And again, we can argue these on the fringes, but pretty much the things that just about every classroom have in terms of those conditions are they're safe, they're positive, they're social, they have teachers, there's feedback going on, and maybe a couple of others, right, in your classroom or the classroom down the hall. But in general, that's pretty much what my kids' classrooms look like in school right now. And look, I'm not throwing teachers under the bus here at all. These are the realities under which you live. And whether you're in Mount Lebanon or you're in my school district in New Jersey or you're in Camden, New Jersey, many of these restrictions are the same. Many of these are constraints are, are, are similar. Although I would guess you probably have fewer than the teachers in Camden who are dealing with a whole bunch of other stuff that's going on in kids' lives. Here's the deal. My children live and learn in different classrooms from the ones that they are in in school. So these are my kids. How many of you own two teenagers right now? Yeah, pretty, pretty interesting times right now, right? My daughter is 17, that's my daughter Tess. She's gonna hopefully graduate in June. Um, my son Tucker is 15, uh, he's a sophomore. They are pretty typical kids. Uh, we take pictures every time my kids are happy at the same time. I don't know if you guys do that or not, but. And this is like number seven in that series. We don't have a lot, you know. Um, <laughs> they're great kids, I love them to death. They are, they're turning out to be really good human beings, which my wife takes all the credit for. I have nothing to do with that. Um, and, but my kids are kind of interesting too in that they're both athletes. My daughter's 6'1", my son is almost 6'2 now. They both play basketball. And right now they are living for basketball. And so they're not entirely academic, if you know what I'm saying. They're not, you know, they're not taking a lot of AP courses. They just don't find that stuff very interesting and whatever else. And I'm really not on that heavy duty AP track, high grade point, go to good college type of track to begin with. Um, I've told my kids, if you want to go to college, that's great, but we're not going to pay for grade 13, if you know what I mean. Um, I think there are too many kids, and my, my daughter's friends right now are going to visit schools, and they're coming to our house, and I'm saying, hey, Liv, you know, where'd you go visit? And she's giving me all these schools. I said, that's great. What are you going to study when you get there? She goes, I really don't know. And a lot of kids are, I really don't know. And that's an expensive, I don't know, at this point. So just so you know, I'm not on that really, you know, um, heavy duty track to college. But here's my kids' classrooms. They hold the sum of human information at their fingertips, pretty much. There's hardly anything that they can't find in terms of answering a factual question by going online through their phones. Hardly any question can't be answered right now in terms of that kind of stuff. If you look at it this way, they have potentially three billion, with a B, teachers in their pockets. If they need to learn something and they have the wherewithal, the skills, literacies, and dispositions to find other people who can help them learn that, pretty amazing thing that they're carrying in their pockets right now. And not only that, but they have an increasingly large universe of tools. Hugely complex in many ways, some of them really simple and stupid, but tools that are in many ways changing the fabric of our society when you think about it. I'm going to talk about Instagram in a little bit in a little bit and how different that kind of world is. So how many of you own kids that play Minecraft? All right, so you'll, those of you that raise your hands, probably 30 of you or so, you'll know exactly what the story is that I'm going to tell. My kid learned Minecraft in about five hours on a snowy Sunday afternoon. And he did it by watching YouTube videos, some of which were not even in English, by the way. He did it by connecting to his online circle of friends who were Minecraft players. He got on an Uvu call with them, which is like a Google Hangout call. On my laptop computer, he took it, he wasn't supposed to, but anyway. He had five kids in an Uvu call, and it was playing in the Minecraft server with those five kids as they were teaching him, and also a whole bunch of other kids from all around the world who were helping him at that point build fire. Because if you don't build fire, the creepers eat you at night and that's not a good thing. Then you have to start all over again. So the first thing is you're highly motivated to build fire, okay? Now, we literally had to pull him off the computer, but by the end of five hours, he was actually making some pretty interesting stuff in Minecraft. And this is not my son, by the way, but it looks just like my son, so I've stolen it and put it in this presentation. Here's the difference. My child, Tucker, would have learned Minecraft in school in a very different way. He would have been given the Minecraft textbook, he would have been told to read chapter one, go home and create a tree. Then the next day they would have brought the tree in, put it on the tree rubric, and to see how the tree was. And 
he would have been told that if you want to build a chest, which is something really important in Minecraft, that you can't do that because the chest doesn't come up until two weeks down the road in the curriculum. My son would not have stood for that. There's no way in the world my kid is going to take a Minecraft class. No way. And by the way, if there are any of you who want to learn Twitter, you got to be more like my kid. If you're waiting for the Twitter workshop, you're missing the point. Because professional development is now in the hands of the professional more than it is in the hands of the institution. That's a huge shift that's occurring and it is incumbent upon all of us to take that kind of learning stance. So here's the deal. My kids' classrooms, about the only one that I can't guarantee is the safety one. But almost all this other stuff happens in these classrooms that my kids are learning in outside of school. And by the way, they're learning a lot. And it's not just about Minecraft. It's about basketball. It's about health. My daughter is probably the fittest, healthiest eater, worker, worker outer that I know. And she has learned that by reading online. She's never taken a, a course in nutrition or fitness or anything like that. She constantly reads. She constantly, go figure, wants to learn more. And so she can. So this environment is productive learning for my kids because they want to learn more. This environment has a certain freedom to it that does not exist in school. In school they go and they are told what to learn, when to learn it, how to learn it, and how they're going to be assessed on it. The dissonance between the learning interactions they have in school and the learning interactions they have outside of school are becoming more and more interesting to watch. And by the way, this learning outside of school, we call it informal, it's learning. There's no question. They are doing deep, important learning in their lives without any adults in the room. Your students also have that freedom. And guess what? So do you. So do you. And there are many of you in this room who are learning deeply and productively about the things you care about without any school context, any institutional context, any teacher-student context at all. Some of it is fringy, you need to learn how to unclog the pipe, so you go and watch YouTube. I mean, there's hardly a person in this room that hasn't gone to YouTube and started a query that says, how do you, right? But you can build a curriculum around those things that you learn. So here we go, really fast. Welcome to this really interesting disruptive moment. And this informal learning versus formal learning thing is not what you signed up for, most of you, when you went, in, when you went into education. This idea that kids can learn your curriculum, perhaps, on their own, without you, that's not what you signed up for when you went into school, but that is when you went into teaching, but that is now the reality. I'm not saying that they should be doing that. I'm saying they can do that. So we have to understand that. But that's a pretty amazing thing. It's a pretty amazing thing that I can pretty much learn anything I want, whenever I want, wherever I am, if I have access. Whether we like that or not as educators, that's a pretty cool development. Look at your kids. Look at the ways that they learn. I'm jealous as hell. I wished I'd had that when I was growing up. My mother used to, I used to drive her crazy. Hey mom, can you take me to the library? Um, my never, kids never asked to go to the library. They got the library in their pockets, pretty much. Now they have to understand how to use that well, I get it, but they have access in ways that I never did. And I'm not saying that schools should go away by any stretch. I think schools are the most important institutions in our communities. I do not want this place to go away, but this school is going to change. Whether you like it or not, it has to be different now. Because the things that kids need to be successful, to flourish in their worlds, are different now from the things that we need. There are different skills, different literacies, different ways of interacting that are important and schools are fundamentally challenged by what's happening on the web. I don't want the same education for my kids that I had, yet my daughter texted me the other day the results of a 20 question multiple choice test in her oceanography class where she got 20 out of 20. It could have been my oceanography test 30 years ago or however many years ago it was. It was more than that, but well, you know what I'm saying. I don't want that same education, yet it looks way too much, way too similar. Same types of courses, same types of schedules, same types of tests, same types of scores, same types of grades, same types of... pretty much the same. Learning with technology is no longer an option. Show me a scientist anywhere in the world that isn't working with technology. You can't find one. And the problem here is, with no disrespect, is that for many of us, 
Our use of technology to learn is behind the curve of a lot of people out there. So let me show you examples of some people who I think are on the curve, who may be leading the curve. Nick Rubin, 16-year-old kid who basically had an interest in politics, which, by the way, he was inspired by taking a class at school, but inspired him to create this really interesting app called Greenhouse, which I've loaded on my computer. Now, any time that I am reading anything about politics, every time there's a name of someone in Congress, that name is automatically highlighted. If I hover over it, his app pops up and tells me how much money that person has taken from various groups in terms of you know, their political, uh, who's supporting them politically. Pretty cool. And I love his tagline. Some are red, some are blue, all are green. <laughs> all of them are about money. Um, nothing to do with school in terms of the development of the app. Did it on his own time, did it with his own technology, learned the computer code, learned the program on his own because he had an interest and was able to do that. Jacob Arnott, 16-year-old kid in Melbourne, who basically started a blog a couple years ago called thesportingjournal.com.au. Got so popular, he was 12 when he started, got so popular when he was 14 years old that basically had about 18 people from around the country writing for him. He had some 45-year-old lawyer in Perth who was interested in Aussie rules football and was writing regularly for the site. Got noticed to the point where when the London Olympics came along, he was invited to go to London to cover the Australian Olympic team with a full press pass. And the only big question in that kid's life at that moment was, should I take three weeks off of school to go to London and cover the Australian Olympic team? Because they go to school in the summer down there. And thankfully he did and he had an amazing experience, or super awesome Sylvia, a kid who walks around in a lab coat. She's a geek, she loves science. She has a YouTube channel that's killer, you can see. She's got almost uh, half a million views on some of the videos. How many of you know what an Arduino is? Raise your hand. Okay, you're all gonna know what an Arduino is probably in the next couple of years. Sylvia will teach you what an Arduino, Makey Makey, Raspberry Pi, these are all maker movement types of technologies now that are, are helping kids and us create things with these small little circuit boards that can do all sorts of really, really cool stuff. Um, basically, she's got all sorts of stuff that she'll teach you and she's one of the best teachers out there when it comes to science. She's also an entrepreneur. How many of you know what Kickstarter is? All right, good. So Kickstarter, if you haven't heard of it, is if you have a great idea and you need a little bit of funding, you don't have to go and get somebody to give you money. You can go online and say, hey, I got this great idea. You want to throw me 20 bucks? So she did. She wanted to make a super awesome Sylvia watercolor bot. Now, to me, I, you know, I wouldn't want this, but she wanted this, where you could take a watercolor that someone had painted, scan it in, and this bot would repaint it. Not just copy it, but repaint it, do another original of it based on the scan. So she went to Kickstarter, asked for $50,000, within a month had $90,000 that people you, like you and me, we just said, yeah, it's a great idea. I'll give you $25, whatever else, and now you can go. Actually, you can go here to watercolorbot.com and you can order that. It'll come to your house as a kit. You can put it together, start scanning watercolors, and you can start creating your own watercolors. And now Sylvia has a book that's on Amazon. If you want to learn from her about projects using makerspace types of stuff, you can learn from her. And then there's this kid. And when I get here, I start thinking what losers my own children are. This kid basically uh, had, was motivated to learn how to come up with or to produce a cancer test because his uncle had pancreatic cancer. I'm just going to play you a little bit of this video and then I'll fill in some blanks here in a second. Most people play basketball outside of school or like some other sport and I don't. I go here every day after school and do cancer research. My name is Jack Andreka and I'm 15 years old. What I've created here is an inexpensive method to detect pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, and lung cancer all in their early stages where you have possibly over 50% survival rate. Okay, so here's what we have here. This is all the test strips I have. So compared to the current gold standard, my sensor is 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than the current standard. It costs only three cents and takes five minutes, meaning that this could be used really in every doctor's office and you could really use it every single week and it would cost you maybe $1.56. Big deal, right? 
no big deal with that kid. Um, <laughs> he tells a couple stories in this video that I think are interesting. Though. He said, number one, I could not have done this without the internet. This kid is standing on the shoulders of giants. You know that phrase, right? He's had access to all the research that has come before him, so he's able to build on that research. Um, he also says, uh, tells the story of how he was in science class one day, and he had downloaded and printed one of these pieces of research that he was reading in his class when the science teacher came over and in his name, in, in his words, uh, confiscated that piece of research because he was supposed to be writing an essay at that moment that he didn't really care about. And that basically he went to, he's a persistent kid, he went to 200 university professors asking for lab time to do this before he finally found one at Johns Hopkins. Now look, this kid, I hope, is an outlier, <laughs> right? Um, he's a pretty amazing kid. But the rest of those kids, Jacob and Sylvia, those are your kids. Those are your kids. They're no different from the kids in your classrooms. There's not a 16-year-old in this district. There's not a 12-year-old in this district who could not start a blog writing to the world of something that they have a passion around, gain a national audience, and do pretty interesting and amazing things. There's not a 12-year-old in your schools that couldn't create a YouTube video that other people could watch and learn from. So this is the world in which we live. Whether or not each of your kids are actually doing this, the opportunities that kids have to do this in and of itself is enough for us to think seriously about our roles as teachers and schools in their lives. Now, good learning has always been about this, but now we have this thing called access. And this access thing, it changes stuff. It just cha it changes things. The internet is the technology of our time. I, I really would be shocked I won't be here to see it. I hope someone will be here to see it. But at the turn of the next century, if people don't look back at the first couple of decades of the 21st century and say, oh my goodness, do you believe all the stuff that changed because of this technology, because of what the web is doing in terms of connecting us, helping us communicate, allowing us to create and share? It's unprecedented. It's mind-boggling on a lot of different levels. And it's a huge change. And if you want it in a nutshell, here it is. In 10 years, we've gone from a world of scarcity of information, knowledge, teachers, and technologies to a world of absolute abundance of that stuff. We are swimming in it. And it may not feel comfortable. We may not feel like we've got our you know, brains wrapped around it or anything else. But basically, it's not an option. This is not whole language or new math. This is not going away. We can't close our doors to it. You may not like it, but you're going to have to understand this, especially as educators. You're going to have to understand the implications and the affordances of the web because those implications and affordances are going to have, if not are already having, a huge impact in your kids' lives. And you need to understand it. We need to help them. I'm not a buyer of that digital natives stuff where kids are born knowing what to do with technology. I think kids absolutely are more comfortable with trying to break the technology, right? You ever see a four-year-old get an iPad? Right? Four-year-old gets an iPad, it's this, right? I guarantee you've never seen a four-year-old go, this is great, when's the workshop? <laughs> they don't do that. They just go. They just start trying to break it. Um, but this is not an option for them. Kids spend 1,000 hours a year in school. They spend 4,000 hours a year with digital media on average. 4,000 hours. Some of that is multitasking. Watching TV, texting, on your laptop, doing homework. That's three hours in one. But still. Um, and again, we may look at that 4,000 hours ago, that's too much. It's that they shouldn't be. Doesn't matter. We have to understand it. I, I'm not saying I disagree with you. I'm not saying that I haven't put limits on my kids' uses of digital time. Absolutely, I have. But whether we like this or not, we have to understand it. We have to contextualize it for the kids in our classrooms and help them understand how to do that well. Almost two billion photos are going to be uploaded to the web today. Two billion. And my kids will take about 7,000 of those without fail. Um, they live through Instagram. I stalk them. That's what my daughter says. Stop stalking me on Instagram. Well, um, that's the way I kind of keep up with my daughter's life. Not that I don't know and we don't have conversations and stuff, but it's interesting 
to see the things that she's taking pictures of, the things that she's sharing, the things that, 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 uh, that she's communicating to the world. Um, and look, this abundance thing is changing a whole bunch of stuff. Ask any journalist what it's like to be a journalist today versus five years ago. It's just a totally different universe. Totally different. Ask any musician what it's like to try to sell your music today as opposed to five, ten years ago. Totally different model. Businesses, no idea what the business model is. Um, almost everything is changing and it's having an impact around the corner. So the lawyer down the street now is not competing with the lawyer around the corner as much as he or she is competing with the lawyers from around the world. And not just lawyers, but entities that provide legal services. So I created an LLC last year. I didn't go to the lawyer on the corner. I went to LegalZoom.com. Because I could do all the paperwork from my home, fill in the credit card, get the paperwork. You know what I'm saying, right? I mean, I don't need an attorney to do that. I'm not saying I don't need an attorney ever, but the role of that attorney is changing. Publishers are not sleeping well at night. Almost a third of the books that are published to Amazon Kindle now are self-published. And if you, if you think reading self-published books is the same as reading traditionally published books, think again. The scary thing about this that came out last fall about Ebola was not so much that the guy that wrote it had absolutely no creds at all about Ebola, just kind of made it up. And this was two weeks after his book on ISIS, by the way. The scariest thing to me about this is that at this point, it was number 3,500 rank on Kindle. The scariest thing about this is people are buying it. What does that say about those people's literacy? When anybody can write anything and you believe it, that's a huge problem. That's an education problem, by the way. I know there are kids in this school who are writing on Wattpad. Wattpad is a uh, fan fiction type of site where basically you can go and write and read all sorts of cool stuff. Two million writers producing 100,000 pieces of material a day, 20 million readers. Here's one called After. Look at that. 255 million reads of this book. 255 million reads. And this is a free book. Anybody can go and read it. Almost a million comments. Talk about engaged readership. A million comments. Here's my favorite comment. This story is really good and I can't stop reading it even though my mom took my phone away and I can't find it, I still find ways to read it. <laughs> that is a highly engaged and motivated reader. I wonder if she would say the same about Othello. I'm an English teacher, I can throw Shakespeare under the bus, right? So, but you know what I'm saying, right? I'm not saying that Shakespeare isn't something we should teach, I'm saying we've got some competition now with a whole bunch of texts that we didn't, kids didn't have access to 10 years ago and now they do. What's the point that we want, or what's the outcome? Do we want kids to be readers? Well, this may be a better way to do that. I don't even have to bring this up, do I? <laughs> Any Twitch viewers here? Couple? So the people who raise their hands are gamers, and what they do at Twitch is basically they go and watch other people play games. They do other things too, but they watch live game playing going on. 45 million viewers, 13 billion minutes of gaming a month. If you don't think that gaming is becoming a very interesting learning context, think again. People are learning, people are now creating games where you can learn algebra by playing a game. You don't even know you're learning algebra. But basically, in the context of the game and the way that you try to win, you have to learn algebra. By the way, Twitch got purchased by Amazon for $1.1 billion. Because what Amazon understands is that the future of the web is live streaming. So you think it's complex now? Just wait five years. Wait till you see how much stuff is going to be live streamed. Um, I have an app from my phone. On my phone, if I have enough bandwidth, I could live stream this presentation to anyone online who has the link. We're printing human tissue. Did you know that? We're printing food. Printing food. Um, we're also printing all sorts of cool stuff up at the space station. I don't know if you heard the story a couple weeks ago. They needed to do a repair. They didn't have the tools, so they sent files to the 3D printer on the space station, printed out 23 different parts that the astronaut assembled, and fixed whatever was wrong on the space station. Do you have 3D printers here yet, by the way? You will. Soon. You'll have more. Soon. Um, if you have a little extra money laying around, your kids can now control a, a satellite in outer space from their phones. Kind of interesting. Any skiers in the room? 
Okay? So this is a, a really nice pair of goggles from Oakley. $650 for this pair of goggles. The reason they're so expensive is because they're Bluetooth enabled. So basically, as you're skiing down the slope, up in the upper right hand corner, you can see how fast you're going, where you've been on the mountain, how high you've jumped, the vertical that you've gone down, the navigation, where you are. You can follow your buddies. You can see where they are up here if they're wearing these same goggles. You can listen to music. You can take phone calls, all of which is why Oakley makes you sign a disclaimer when you buy these, saying if you fall into a, plow into a tree, it's not their fault. You shouldn't be doing this stuff, but you could. <laughs> and oh, by the way, even though Google Glass seems to be near its demise, which to be honest, I think is a really good thing. Google Glass is insured now. It's insurable. So these types of technologies are becoming more mainstream. Any Fitbit wearers? Okay. So if you're a Fitbit wearer, you, many of you probably are, are thinking about wearing something like this to collect data on what you do, on your activities or whatever else. It's a great thing. This is one of my better weeks. Um, but who's reading all that data? What are the privacy concerns here? What happens to the stuff that you're collecting on you? Who, who gets it? Marketers? Doctors? What? Um, here's a new toothbrush, by the way, which connects Bluetooth to your phone so that as you're brushing, it collects data on your phone, which sends then a report to your dentist. So when you go for your checkup, the dentist has a readout that says, you've only brushed an average of 32 seconds of, uh, per, per uh, session this month. And they're trying to get a camera in this so basically it can send a report saying, hey, this guy has a cavity in his left molar, you know, come in and... Now again, the question becomes, do you want that data collected? Well, if it makes your teeth healthier, maybe you do. But there are privacy issues here. And, and this is one thing. How many of you teach your students in this district anything about privacy of information that's being collected on them? Every hand should be going up right now. Every hand should be going up. Because this is a huge, huge industry now, the data collection industry, and we are in many ways becoming algorithms that are manipulating much of our lives. And if we are allowing that to happen without some understanding of it, could be a problem. So here we go, just to really fast again, information is number one. And so I love this picture, this is the Library of Stuttgart, but think of it as represent representation of almost everything there is to know in the world. And I'm going to argue that almost everything there is to know in the world is now online. And how do I know that? Well, at the turn of the 20th century, I had a great grandfather who was a horrible novelist, really bad, wrote four books, couldn't get them published, took them to a publisher, but they were so bad that you know, they wouldn't even look at them. So he took them to a vanity press at that point, had 50 hardcover um, copies of this one book called Eight Days Out, Mackinac and the Sioux. It was a bunch of hobos riding around on boxcars in the Midwest, meeting up with bandits and stuff. It's so bad, literally. I have a copy. I have one of those hard copies on my bedside. When I can't sleep at night, I literally open this up, read like three paragraphs, and I'm out. I mean, it's horrible. It's really, really bad. So last year, I read another article how Google, did you know Google is trying to scan every known book in the universe and put it up online? I don't know if you knew this or not, but if you go to Google Books, uh, Google Scholar, if you look at those places, I decided to do a search for my grandfather's book. And so my grandfather's intended audience of 50 is now about 3 billion. Because not only can you get it on Google Books, it's also in the Internet Archive. I think it's interesting here. You can get it as a PDF. You can get it for your Kindle. Um, people have tried to do an audio book, but they couldn't get through it without falling asleep, so that was no good. Um, 50 copies in 1895, and now you can read it on your phone. A little bit of a different world that we live in from an information sense. And by the way, oh yeah, by the way, when people say Google can't do that, all the courts say, oh yeah, they can. They can scan every known book in the universe, that's okay. People, you know, a lot of people, this is my Twitter kind of graph, a lot of people say, well, three billion people out there, that's, that's a really risky thing. And I say, well, you could look at that picture and you can see three billion strangers, or you could look at that picture and you can see three billion teachers. I choose the latter. I'm not saying that everybody out there is a teacher. But I'm going to say something that makes you uncomfortable. I know this is going to make you uncomfortable. I want my own children to be found by strangers on the internet. And I'll let that hang there for a second. So, you know. Look, the idea that my kids are not going to be interacting with people who they don't know the rest of their lives online is ridiculous. They are. And by the way, some of the best teachers in my life are people who were strangers on the internet, people who I connected with. Now, I had the skills and literacies to kind of figure out who they were, 
my kids are not being taught how to connect, how to find really good strangers, how to connect with strangers, how to be connected with strangers. Um, and that's a huge missed learning opportunity right now. So when I was teaching The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk Kidd in my 2002 Modern American Literature class, and my kids had a blog, and they were writing about themes, and they were doing symbols and all sorts of good stuff, they actually had Sue Monk Kidd in the blog writing to them answering their questions. And I think they probably learned a little bit more from her than they did from me about that particular book. If you have an internet connection in your room, you're not the smartest person in the room any longer. And I figured out early on that one of my main roles as a classroom teacher was connecting my kids to the smartest people that I could find outside of the room. And I had some brilliant, brilliant people coming into my classroom virtually on a regular basis that changed the whole dynamic in what I did in my classroom. It was pretty cool. And then there's the tools piece. And you know, you look at this, and basically, um, uh, you can't make sense of this. There's no way. This rep representation is obsolete the day that it's published because a lot of these tools are already done. They're already folded and whatever else. And there's new ones. What is I think it's, I don't know, even know what the number is. Two million apps in the App Store now. How do you figure out what the good apps are and what the not so great apps are? It's, it's almost impossible. If you don't have a good network right now of people who are filtering all this stuff, helping you filter it, good luck. Because you can't do this on your own. Okay, so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I turned it down. So, math teachers, raise your hands. Okay, I'm sorry. tell you right now that photo math app doesn't work as great as it's represented here but you get the point and uh, it will work as great as represented here sooner rather than later and it's not just gonna be math now I know we look we can we can probably argue the rest of the day whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing it doesn't really matter what we think it's here so this has to start some conversations. These types of technologies, I think, at the very least, have to start some conversations. What do kids have to know? What are kids going to have to know? You know, my, my wife went to Georgia Tech, and when she took her final exams at Georgia Tech, she had to have all the formulas up here. Today, kids take finals at Georgia Tech, bring the formulas with them. Because guess what? The formulas are everywhere now. My wife, you know, she was taught, look, you got to have them up here because you may not have access to the formula when you need it. Well, guess what? Formulas are everywhere now. So you don't have to remember it anymore. You have to know what to do with it. Anyway, it's changing. And by the way, if you don't think these types of ed technologies are going to continue to grow and continue to make an impact, they are. Guess how much money is going to be spent on ed tech this year? Woohoo! Yeah, baby. That's a lot of money that people want you to spend on their stuff. And so they're going to continue to innovate. They're going to continue to make stuff. So it's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And that's a problem right now, because we live in a world marked by ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous information, ubiquitous networks, and a limited speed about everything, everywhere, and anywhere, and all kinds of devices make it ridiculously easy to connect, organize, share, collect, collaborate, and publish. Raise your hand if you describe this district like that. But that's the world your kids step into. Whether or not they know what to do in that world is a different question. But that's the world that your kids step into when they leave here. That world is taken away from them when they come through the doors, when my kids go through their doors as well. So whether you like it or not, here we are. This is the moment that we're in. We have this traditional narrative around what learning and education looks like. It's one that you most, most of you in this room hold. It's most of, the, most of the parents in this district, I'm sure, hold to this narrative, most of the legislators, whatever else. Yet now there's a whole other narrative that's, that's building 
that is much more informal, that we can learn on our own in ways that the present system doesn't support, doesn't understand, doesn't contextualize, whatever else. It's the difference between delivery of information instead of discovery of information. It's the difference between consuming things in private, which is what schools do in, what kids do in school versus creating things in public, which was what they do outside of school, sometimes to their own detriment. It's what we want kids to learn versus what they want to learn. It's time and place versus any time, anywhere, anyone. It's just in case you need to know the Pythagorean theorem at some point in your life, you're going to get it in eighth grade whether you want it or not, versus, hey, I need to figure out this problem. Can I find the solution? Can I learn the Pythagorean theorem when I need it? Now, I get it. I need to know I need to know it. It's not quite that simple, but you know what I'm saying. There's a whole bunch of stuff in our curriculum that we're teaching the kids. Uh, you need to get this now because you may not get it anywhere else. So just in case you need it someday, and if you guys are honest, you know that you've never used the vast majority of stuff you learned in high school. You've never used it. Just in case, though, you got it. Well, now that that stuff is everywhere, do we have to have a different conversation around curriculum? Just asking. And it's not working, by the way. David Edwards from Harvard, it is increasingly true that this system of education is built for a world that doesn't exist. And here's the latest Pew survey of student engagement. And I've lived this. First grade back to school night. First words out of my son's first grade teacher were, first grade is where we learn the rules. <laughs> and I wanted her to say, first grade is where we play harder than we did in kindergarten. But this is what has happened to my own children. 44% of kids in high school, 44% say that they are engaged somewhat. Four million kids enter high school every year, 20% drop out before graduation. Half don't pursue education past the high school diploma. Half of those who do, do pursue it don't finish a degree. And then 52% of those kids who do finish the degree get a job that doesn't require the degree. So that's a 10% success rate if we're defining success as graduating from college and getting a job with your degree, which I think probably most parents in this community, that's how they would define it. That number may not be accurate for your district, but you get what I'm saying. So the new reality is our information knowledge, teachers in abundant supply, it's expanding and changing like never before. We can't predict what's coming next. We're printing human tissue. Who knows what's coming next? If you think the skills and literacies that helped you guys navigate your worlds are the same skills and literacies that are going to help the kids in your classrooms navigate their worlds, I'd humbly ask you to think again. Access to and the creation of sharing of information is now uncontrollable. You cannot control it. You can block it, filter it, you can do all that good stuff, but you're not going to control it at the end of the day. And that, all that stuff is not the world that school was built for. Just to drive it home really hard, here we go. In general, we're moving away from institutions toward the self. All those things I used to need, I don't need any longer. All those people I used to need, I don't need them any longer. And in an education setting, the key shift is that we are literally moving away from an institutionally organized education to a self-organized education. Because if my kids want to learn algebra, I don't need them to go to your school to learn algebra any longer. If the measure of learning algebra is to pass the algebra test, I don't need you for that any longer. My kids can learn algebra on their own well enough to pass the test. And that's always kind of been true, but now it's true with just about every piece of curriculum that we teach. Just about. If the measure of success or mastery of the curriculum that we teach is being able to pass a test in that content, I don't need you for that any longer. I'm not saying I don't need you. I absolutely need you because I want my children to be in classrooms with adults who are smart and inspirational and caring and who will push them to greater heights than they could ever achieve on their own but if at the end of the day that's going to be measured by a GPA only, that's a problem. So we're moving from systems to networks and welcome to it. That is the disruption. Now you may not be feeling that very much right now, but you will be and I'm going to show you why I think that's coming. So here's the deal. If that's all the information there is to know in the world, welcome to school. And you know that little rectangle was defined by 10 middle-aged white guys in 1894 the Committee of Ten. Those of you who passed your history class and your pre-service programs, I'm sure, remember the History of Ten, don't, or the Committee of Ten, right? 
But let's make no mistake about what that is. Just a guess. Your curriculum is just a guess. That's all it is. It's your guess as to what kids need in order to flourish and be successful in their lives. The problem is the answer, that guess, hasn't changed much in about 125 years. So now that we have access to everything, what billionth are you choosing to teach? What billionth of everything there is to know is in your curriculum now? And how do you know that you have the right billionth? It's an interesting question. If these are all the people there are in the world to learn from, welcome to school and please hear this. These people are crucially important in my kids' lives. I want my kids with these people, but these people cannot be the only teachers in my kids' lives any longer. These people in the physical space cannot be the only people that my kids learn with any longer. And if these are all the technologies that are in the world, welcome to school, where in many cases we just block, filter them, whatever. I'm, uh, you know, half the places I go, my blog is blocked. I'm a subversive of some type, I don't know. All right, but here's the deal. If you can get your brain around that and that and that, you better be confused. You better be confused. Because this is a much different world. What is an education now? How are we going to define that? Are we seriously going to define an education by only the stuff that's in the curriculum? Because if we do that, then that and that and that don't count. Really? We can't do that. We're not going to be able to do that much longer. What does every single student need to know? We have to ask that question. What's the role of school? What's the role of a teacher? And what do we need to be successful modern learners? So let me give you some sense of what this part looks like. Modern learning now means that you are connected. Modern learners are connected with other people outside of their physical spaces. They are interacting with them on a regular basis. They are learning with them, creating things with them. They're doing some really cool stuff. So this is my LinkedIn graph. I don't know how many of you are in LinkedIn, on LinkedIn, who use LinkedIn. Um, and this is just a representation. That's me in the middle, and these are people who I'm connected to, some of whom I have met face-to-face, -face, probably 1% of the people here have I ever met face-to-face, -face. the rest of them. Um, many of them I've never had an interaction with, but for, for, uh, for networking's sake, I want them, because of their backgrounds and whatever, to be there. And look, here's the deal. I want my kids to have something that looks like this when they graduate, but they're not. Their networks are being built without us. They're not getting any help, any context, any literacy from school as to how to go out and build powerful learning networks that they can interact with and learn from on a regular basis. So I want to play a little video of a first grade class using Twitter to learn how to read and write. So take a look at this. Use Twitter in our classroom to connect other classes and to help us to learn. Twitter helps us to learn to read and write. We can write about things that happen in our classroom or reply to tweets. At first we read all the, treat, uh, all the tweets together. So we're getting to be re better readers. So we can read Twitter ourselves with our iPads. When we first started using Twitter, we wrote all of our tweets together with our class. Now we can tweet ourselves. Sometimes we use hashtags so that all of our tweets can go together with the tweet other kids write. We tweeted secrets about Santa. We like Twitter because it helps us to learn and because it's fun. So a couple things she said in there, um, you know, to connect to other classrooms, we use, we use hashtags to connect our tweets to other kids from around the world. Kathy, who's the teacher here, does a great job of mediating that. These are first graders. She's not just throwing them up there on Twitter, obviously. She's got some, some, uh, some plan around that. But these kids understand that there are other kids in other classrooms around the world who are learning about the same things that they are and that they can connect to those people. Um, they can write about Santa, which they have a passion for and they care about. A lot of those conditions for learning that we talked about before end up in that classroom. And, you know, Twitter's kind of interesting. I mean, if you're not on Twitter, you may hear a lot of people say, well, I should try Twitter. Um, 
I think that a lot of people, most educators who are on Twitter will tell you it's one of the best professional development tools. In fact, if you go to Jane Hart, 100 top learning tools in the world right now, this is 2014, 2015 is coming up, but Twitter's at the top. And um, it's a great place to start, at least, to begin to get connected uh, and, and to try to um, get some sense around what that kind of connected learning means. But it is about networks. It is about you learning with people who you don't know around the things that you share an interest or passion for. And it's important that you are able to do that so that you can help your kids understand what that looks like. So it also means making now. You know, the four C's, right? Uh, critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. Those are the four C's. Those get thrown out a lot. All wonderful things. I'm not sure they're 21st century skills. I mean, those things have been important in the 19th century, 20th century. I do think there are two new C's, though, and the one was connections. The other one is computing. Um, we, in schools, I probably use about 10% of the potential of the devices that we hand out when it comes to computing power. Um, we don't use much of, of any of the stuff that you can actually do with computers. So if you can use technology to make things, and by the way, if you want one book to change your mind around technology and learning, this is it, Mindstorms. It's 25 years old. Um, Seymour Papert is the biggest influence in my life um, in, in this kind of technology and learning context. And this idea of making things with computers now, understanding the, the computing power that we have in our hands is really important. So when Steve Wozniak and Ashton Kutcher were making the first Apple computers, basically they got together and they were iterating. You know, here's one interesting thing about my kids' lives. They never fail in school. They never fail. And I'm not just talking about they never fail a test or they never fail something that they're graded on. I'm saying they never come home and say, yeah, I was trying to work this out and I, could, I tried this and it didn't work, so I tried something else and that didn't work and then I tried, I had to do this. And they never talk about learning like that. Yet is there one among us who doesn't iterate? Who doesn't try something and then learn and try something different and then learn? If, if you're a teacher, and my kids have had some of these teachers who have basically taught the same class 20 years in a row, right? But you know as well as I do that iteration is the key to, to making things that are really interesting. All right, so here you go. This will this will wake you up a little bit if you're half asleep. Um, I just want you, as you watch this video, well, and yeah, they iterated. They made a lot of mistakes, by the way. Um, their computer these days is a little prettier than that one. I just want you to watch the numbers in this video, okay? And just think about this kid and how he did this. Tonight I'm gonna have myself a real good time. I feel alive. Watch the numbers. I'm a racing car. Like Lady Godiva. I'm gonna go, go, go. There's no stopping me. I'm burning through the sky. 200 degrees. That's why they call me Mr. Fahrenheit. I'm traveling at the speed of light. I wanna make a supersonic man out of you. Don't stop me now. I'm having such a good time. So I would hire that kid for anything. <laughs> I mean, think about the planning, the persistence, the, the creativity, all the stuff that went into that. He actually had to make another video to talk about how he did it. Um, he said he started it one, the first iteration of it, he started, went for four days, couldn't take it anymore. I mean, already he was like, oh no, how am I going to do this? But he, for three years, he took 
two pictures a day without doing anything with them until the end of that three-year period when he put them all together into this video. But that was his concept from the very beginning. Now, the, the, the deal with that is you can't do that without a computer. So how much of the stuff that we use computers for can you do it without a computer? Um, most, probably, of what we're doing in our classrooms with computers. We don't really need the computers for stuff like that. You need it. And basically, this idea of making things, programs, novels, vo video, robots, it is the game changer. Uh, and it, it is, by the way, a great book. Gary's book, Invent to Learn, is, is an amazing book on the maker movement. And this maker education initiative, I'm sure Pittsburgh has a maker space, does it not? You guys know of it? Does it? Yeah? Yeah. Um, they may even have a Maker Fair. I don't know if there's a Maker Fair in Pittsburgh, but if, it, if there is one, please go and see the things that people are making with technology. And then think about the learning process that occurs as they make things with technology that don't work on the first iteration. Now, this Maker Education Initiative is huge. MIT, for example, now has a special part of its application for Maker kids. They want to know what have you made with technology, what worked, what didn't work, what did you learn from that. And I'm going to read the quote from this woman from MIT, and I'm going to just have you considered this quote as the mantra for your own classrooms, okay? What if your classrooms had students in them that are already solving problems and building, playing and creating, engaging in projects they love doing? Because those are the kids MIT wants. The kids who are engaging in projects they love doing, who are learning productively in the classroom. And that these maker technologies are a huge way that that can happen. What if that was your bar that you set for what happened in your classrooms? Modern learning means school is everywhere. I don't need to spend a lot of time on Khan Academy. I'm sure you're all familiar with Khan Academy. Khan Academy played a huge role in my daughter's life. My daughter had a physics teacher who was one of those teachers who taught one year of physics 20 years in a row. And she was struggling. And if not for Khan Academy, she would have failed that class. When she got a C, we had a party. Literally. And she watched con videos over and over and over again. And basically was able to pass the test pretty much because of con. And your curriculum is on con. Now. Almost all of it. He's moving now to the more liberal arts side, or the more ELA side, social studies, language arts. Shakespeare's coming to con soon. So basically, again, if you want to learn American civics well enough to pass the test, con is basically saying, you can do that here. They've got badges now that you can earn. So you take tests and you earn badges and you may think this is funny, but at some point, sometime, if it hasn't happened already, someone's going to look at someone else and say, you have 25 badges from Khan Academy? You're educated. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. SATs being realigned. You know who's doing all the SAT prep, don't you? Khan Academy. All of it. And here's the thing about Khan, aside from getting lots of money from lots of corporate sponsors. Khan's mission, a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And my question is, what if he's right? What if he's right? Now, it depends on what? It depends on how you define world-class education. I'm sure that in this district, you feel that you are offering a world-class education to the kids that go to school here. Khan saying, I can do that. Now, look, if the measurement is <laughs> passing tests in all those content areas, he might be right. And by the way, the USDOE is going to find out. They're spending $3 million to answer that question. Now, it's going to be really interesting if the DOE comes back and says, well, yeah, he's right. You can get a free world-class education in Khan Academy. That'll be interesting. Now, I'm not saying this stuff is bad stuff. Bozeman Science is a great site. If you haven't seen it, it's great stuff. Wolfram Alpha, math teachers, if you haven't played with Wolfram Alpha, uh, you know, spend, don't, I mean, don't go there because you'll spend probably the next three days there. It's an amazing, amazing site that's rethinking how you do math. And this is how kind of early it happens. Dragonbox, which is an iPad app for kindergartners, says basically if you take something way over here, you got to take it away over here. 
Basically, kids are learning algebra, and the question becomes, what does a middle school algebra teacher do if kindergartens can start learning to solve equations within a couple of hours? And by the way, who said algebra has to wait till seventh grade or sixth grade, wherever it is? Who's, is there a law somewhere that says that? Modern learning means organizing and education. Now, here's what's going to happen for many of your kids in high school right now, but this is especially going to be relevant for the kids who are in your elementary and middle schools right now. So there's this narrative in this country that says if you want the ticket to a middle class existence, what do you need? College education, right? You need to have a college education. And my mother knew that on my graduation day from Ohio University in 1974 when she was looking at me with about as much pride as you can possibly stuff into one person at any given moment. She was a Swedish immigrant right off the boat after World War II. We grew up on the west side of Chicago. Uh, my dad was gone when I was seven. She was working as a manager of a Holiday Inn. We ate a lot of Oscar Mayer hot dogs and French's instant mashed potatoes. Anyone uh, know that delicacy where you put ketchup on them, make them sweet potatoes, right? And it was kind of the dinner I had at the hotel last night. But um, now. She kept saying to me when I was growing up, Willie, you're going to college. And I was like, okay, yeah, right. We had no money. And she was like, I don't know, we're gonna make it happen. Somehow we made it happen. My dad came in, he actually threw some bucks my way. I took out a couple loans. I, I delivered like 70,000 Domino's pizzas when I was at college. And I got through college and I got the degree. And the other thing my mother's feeling in that picture is relief. Because I was gonna be okay. Because she bought into the narrative. If I had the degree, I was gonna be okay. And she was right. I got a job right out of college. My life has been amazing in no short order because I got that degree at the time that I got it. Now, I think I mentioned that, um, well, I didn't mention that the price of a full out-of-state tuition room and board education at Ohio University way back when, when I was there was about $4,000 a year. And I think I mentioned I own two teenagers. And the calculus is a little different now, if you haven't noticed, as I'm looking out over the next you know, four years or so, eight years. Now, the price of an education has had huge impact on our society right now. There are people in this room who are carrying student debt. Some of you may be carrying lots of student debt. And for many of you, basically, it may be preventing you from buying a home, starting a family. Um, I know lots of people who uh, are just kind of literally scraping by because they have jobs, but because their student debt is so high that it's, it's difficult right now. And by the way, Coming up in the next 10 years, you're going to see a lot of small colleges who are heavily in debt, can't refinance, and don't have the numbers to sustain the programs. And you're seeing it almost on a weekly basis now. Small liberal arts colleges are folding up. They're cutting programs. They're cutting faculty. They're cutting all sorts of stuff. Some, shockingly, are cutting athletics. What a concept, right? So here's the deal with higher ed, too. It's not working very well. New York Times last year, 44% of graduates in 2012 were underemployed. Wall Street Journal, 48% were working in jobs that don't require a four-year degree. Those numbers haven't changed much. They've gotten better as the economy has improved, but still, those are huge numbers when you think about it. And here's a survey where it said 11% of business leaders strongly agree that graduating students from college have the skills and competencies that their businesses need. 11%. Same here from Northeastern, or, yeah, Northeastern. 87% contend that most college graduates lack the skills critical to success. It's not working. It's not working. So what do we do? Well, I'm not sure, but things are happening now because as the price of education continues to go up, now we find ourselves at this very interesting moment when the price of information is almost zero. A lot of the stuff that I used to pay to get in college, I don't need to pay to get that stuff in college any longer. I can study macroeconomics on my own, right? So I'm not saying that just because we have access to all this information makes us educated. That's not what I'm saying. Those are two very different things. But I am saying that when you have a difference between the price of an education and the price of information, interesting things start to happen in that gap. A lot of people start to innovate in that gap. Because guess what? There are a whole bunch of people who can't afford it. And so here's what happens. MOOCs, massively open online courses. Any MOOC takers in the room? Couple? Three or four. These are free courses from major universities. Two years ago, when they first started this, a lot of people were saying, this is the end of traditional education as we know it. Clay Christensen, who wrote a book called Disrupting Class, said 50% of all colleges will be bankrupt by 2025. 
He's still saying it, although a lot of people are like, There's, that's not going to happen. But it's having a huge impact. I know you can't see this. Here are some of the courses that you could be taking right now. Okay? These all started last week. Moral Foundations of Politics from Yale University. If you're into that, you can take that for free. Or uh, Introduction to Learning Technologies from the University of Saskatchewan. Free. Or Do You Have What It Takes to Be a Veterinarian from the University of Edinburgh? Free. Now look, you don't get credit for this. You don't get a credit. You get a certificate if you pass the test. But more and more, a lot of people are like, I don't really care about the credit. Because guess what's happening? More and more people now are saying, I don't really care where you went to school. I care about what can you do. Used to be, in a less transparent world, if I'm a business owner and you're applying for a job, that credential is really important to me because it, it tells me a lot about your education. But I'm, what you can do with that degree isn't that transparent. Now, kids walk in to get a job, people are saying, show me what you've done with your degree. I have a niece who graduated from Rutgers two years ago, can't find a job. She's in nutrition. Well, what are you doing with the degree? Well, I'm polishing up my resume. I said, no, 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 no. What are you doing? She's not doing anything. The kids who do, it doesn't matter that she has the degree. The kids who are doing something, who are thinking entrepreneurially around their degrees, who are out there actively making stuff, those are the people that, people are, that, that are getting hired. So it's a different world when Wharton puts its entire first year MBA program online for free. It's a different world when you can get a $10,000 bachelor's degree without ever entering a physical space classroom. It's a different world when AT&T has its own degree program. I'm going to say that again. AT&T has its own degree because they're tired of hiring people out of college who can't do the work. And now there are other corporations who are creating their own degrees. It's a different world when Wired Magazine can create a program with the University of Southern California. It's a different world when Bard College, one of the best liberal arts colleges in the country, says, you know what? We no longer care what your GPA is, how many AP tests you took, what your SAT scores are, none of that. Here are four questions. You answer these four questions good enough to get a B plus from our professors, you're in. It doesn't matter what your educational background is. Or Goucher College in Maryland. We don't care what your SAT scores are, what your AP classes were, what your GPA is, any of that stuff. Do a five minute video. If it's creative and interesting enough, you're in. Free online university, accredited degree. Free. Seven people I know, 5,000 by 2016. Stanford, well, we're not going to do majors any longer maybe. Let's do missions. Because missions are about what you can do with what you know. And by the way, if you don't think that that informal stuff that kids are doing is going to count, it's going to count. Badges are coming our way in some form. There will be alternative credentialing programs, not necessarily going through college. So if you think this is the narrative that's going to lead you to success, you need to start thinking again. I'm not saying that a college degree is a bad thing. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying that a college degree is no longer enough. It's no longer enough. And basically, there are now lots of learning opportunities that are occurring for kids and for us. And if you don't think that those kids, your kindergarten kids, in 2027, are going to have an amazing array of ways to get educated, think again. They are. There will be many narratives for those kids. And if you're preparing them just for one, if you're preparing the kids in this district simply to be college ready, you're not preparing your kids for the world. You're not. Because then you're preparing them to go somewhere and wait to be told what to learn, when to learn it. Dave Cormier, one of my favorite bloggers, a university professor up in Canada, the other day blog said 95% of the kids who come to his classroom in freshman year are not engaged learners. 95%. They are simply sitting there waiting to be told. What do I have to learn today? We've trained them very well to wait. Last part of this, a new world of work. This guy says in 100 years, all the jobs are going to be gone. Now, that's hyper hyperbolic. I get that. But he's not saying all the work will be gone. But look, I've already said to my kids, and you've heard these statistics too, but I've said this to my children over and over again. Look, you're not going to get a 30-year career. 
That's not just, and you're probably not going to get a job that has a pension and health insurance and life insurance and all those other bennies that basically my generation and, and you know, oh my, I can't believe I just said my generation, but anyway, people expected way back then. No. The Department of Bureau of Labor Statistics says 14 different careers or something like that. I don't know, throw a number in there, but you get the idea. The idea that businesses are going to hire people full time, why would they do that in a world of abundance? Because now they have access to a million lawyers, not just one. Or a billion graphic designers. Or whatever. Tech leaps, job losses, rising inequality. Look, I love this graph. This tells it all in terms of the future work. If you're preparing kids for main tasks that require following explicit instructions and obeying well-defined rules, which sounds a lot like school, if you're preparing them for that, lots of luck. Because you know what else can follow explicit instructions and obey well-defined rules? Computers and technologies. And whatever computers and technology can take over in terms of the job market, they are going to take over in terms of the job market. That's the way it's always been. The difference now is a lot of people are worried that new jobs are not going to be created out of that. So. This non-routine occupation, flexibility, problem-solving, creativity, that's where kids will succeed. And are you preparing them for that? Now, here's, I think, a great kind of graphic on that. So if you want to get a sense how it's changed in the business world, Kodak, right, had 135,000 employees at its heyday, served I don't know how many millions of customers, lots and lots of customers, but Instagram, which just got bought by Facebook, 30 million customers, 13 employees. 13 employees. Technology is going to carry much of the weight that humans used to carry before. And so the job market is absolutely changing. New York Times last year, I love this. The need to constantly adapt is a new reality for workers. How are you helping the children in this district constantly adapt? It's rhetorical. But are you constantly helping them change things up? Or do they know the rules and they're playing really well by those rules? Serial mastery. Become master at something, six months later or a couple of years later, you have to be master of something else because it's going to constantly change. School is so predictable. I can tell you exactly what my son's going to be studying in math class on April 13th, assuming that's a school day because I know exactly how the curriculum is going to be meted out. Take any class, I can tell you almost exactly what he'll be doing on that particular day if I just look at the curriculum pacing guide. It's so predictable. Life is not predictable. How are we helping kids deal with unpredictability, especially today? Especially when we don't know what's coming next. So learning is the work, that's it. You're going to get a job, those kids in your schools are going to get a job and if they're not constantly learning, they're not going to have a job. They're not going to have a job. And I love this quote. The vast majority of us now work in environments where the ability to learn is more critical than what we know and where the most valuable currency is influence, not power. The ability to learn. It does not matter so much what you know. It matters some. But what really matters is can you learn? Can you continue to learn in a fast-changing environment? So we have freelancers. That's a lot of people say that, you know, in the next 10 years, freelancers are, are, are going to be the majority of people in the workforce. 53 million already in the United States. 53 million fr freelancers already. And so that means a significant portion of your school population is going to end up in jobs where they are independent consultants, contractors, or freelancers. If they're not innovating, if they're not problem solving on a regular basis, they're not learning on a regular basis, they're not going to succeed. So let me finish this up. In a self-organized, connected world, what's more urgent then? Is it content, knowledge, or information, which is pretty much our emphasis here in schools still? Or is it this stuff, which all happens to start with C for the sake of alliteration, but you get the idea. Is it creativity? By the way, how many of you have a test for creativity? How many of you assess curiosity on a regular basis? How many of you have an assessment for collaboration? So here's the deal with this graph, and you know what I'm going to say. If we don't, well, let me, let me make, this, make sure I get this right. <laughs> right now, we are 
valuing the things that we measure. Because these are easy to measure. Do you know it or not? Can you spit it back or not? Can you apply it in some limited ways or not? We better be assessing what we value. But we're not. And this is a huge issue right now. Because I'm totally convinced that in my kids' lives, these are the things that are going to differentiate them from other kids. Totally convinced of that. And yet I have no idea in the context of school what's happening with any of that. All I get is a number. That's all I get. Now you want transformation, and I know this is hard, right? But if you think you want to change, it's not that hard to change, I don't think, if you come at it from the right direction. If I asked you right now to put a dot on this matrix, and I said, where are you in terms of teacher-organized classrooms versus student-organized? And where are you in terms of breadth of curriculum versus depth of curriculum? I think most of you are probably going to put the dot down here. How many of you do not do lesson plans? One person. Is that okay for people to know that? I don't know. Those people were very shy about that, by the way. They were kind of like this, right? Everybody else in this room does lesson plans. You guys are the ones who are organizing the curriculum for kids. And you probably, because of the scope of the curriculum, you don't have a chance to go real deep, do you? There are probably moments when you're sitting there going, oh man, I wish I had more time for this, but I can't, because I got to be here. I got to be there. Well, look, that's a world of scarcity. That's a world that says you have to organize it because there's just, you know, there's not enough time, whatever else. In a world of abundance, however, we need to be in places where kids are organizing their own learning more and more and where they get to go deep because if they get to become masters at something, then they learn how to learn. They learn how to learn and that is the difference and that, by the way, is the transformation from knowing to learning. That is the transformation and it is about this, by the way. You want to transform your school? Here's where you start. And if I haven't made this really clear, let me do so now. This requires zero technology. None. I've had, I had a superintendent in South Carolina say to me, oh yeah, we just bought, tw we just bought iPads for all 70,000 students, high school students in this state or in my district or whatever else. And I said, oh really, why'd you buy the iPad? She goes, well, we wanted to raise student engagement. And I said, if you want to raise student engagement, you don't have a technology problem. You have a curriculum problem. She was not happy when I said that. And by the way, though, if you've got it, that stuff becomes really interesting, though. Relevance, audience, all that type of stuff. If you have technology, then it amplifies your ability to do that type of transformation. So here we go. This is what's coming. Not these little Peruvian kids with their one laptop per child, but what they represent. <laughs> They're coming! <laughs> Look out! <laughs> Five billion people online by the end of this decade. Five billion people. Okay? Five billion. And they're going to be learners, and they're going to be connected, and they're going to be creating, and they're going to change the world. And I'm going to tell you right now, those people who are coming online, online right now from around the world and others who are coming to these types of connected opportunities to learn online will not stand for that any longer. Not when they have access to that. And they won't stand for that, even though those are really good people who can be very inspirational and important in those kids' lives. But they're not going to stand for that, not when they have access to that. And here's the deal. You guys wouldn't either. You wouldn't either. Given the choice between those two things, you really going to pick this and those five people over everything there is to know and five billion people? Really? You wouldn't. Not in a learning context. Because that second choice is pretty powerful and pretty amazing if you know what you're doing with it. If you have the skills, literacies, and dispositions to make sense of it. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, your kids and your parents have about had enough. This is starting more and more around the country now. And they are standing up and saying, you know what? This is ridiculous. It's not working. It's not relevant. So many places I go when I talk to parent groups, my kids are totally disengaged. My kids totally don't care about what's happening in school. Or they have that one little thing that kind of sustains them. 
Why couldn't, my friend Gary says, school should be the best seven hours of a kid's day? So our kids need us to help them flourish here, but that means we gotta be different. If you're gonna chase better, if you're gonna chase US News and World Report best national high schools based on AP scores, SAT scores, GPAs, and college acceptances, go ahead. That's not helping your kids. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, US News and Newsweek and all those other people's polls and rankings and whatever else are heavily funded by, by companies that uh, really have an interest in those numbers. They don't want those. If, if you think that most people in business want us to change the narrative, think again. Absolutely not. Because if it can't be quantified, it's not something that they really want to deal with. Yet I'm arguing the best part, the most important part, of what we do in schools can't be quantified in the ways that you know we've looked at numbers in the past so learning is now the work and your big question is can you prepare kids for this if you don't have a personal context for that type of learning yourselves and this is really really the hard part at the end of the end of the day this is what it comes down to are you a modern learner are you connected with other people outside the classroom? Are you pursuing your passions through technology? Are you making things that you're sharing with the world, beautiful, meaningful, important things that you're sharing with the world and changing the world? Because it's hard if you're not to be able to contextualize and understand that type of learning for your kids. So I'm gonna ask you guys to think of yourselves as learners first right now because learning is the work, learning is the work. And that means you too. Sometimes I think we have two cultures that are too teaching-centric. And I'm, again, I'm not saying teaching is a bad thing. It's not. It's a great profession. It's an honorable, important profession. But in a context or a time when learning is the coin of the realm, I think we need to be learners first and educators second. I think that we need to be able to model for our kids the type of learning opportunities that are available. And it, some of it sucks. Some of it's complex. Some of it's dark. Some of it's negative. Yeah, we have to deal with it. Our kids are in that world. It's not going away. We can make it better. But we have to figure that out in our own practice and in our own lives as well. So it's a really challenging time for you. I get it. But it is a most amazing time to be a learner. And let me just end with, with this quote. In times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. I really want to thank you for your time and attention this morning. I hope that that was helpful. And I wish you great success in whatever path you take for the kids that you serve. They need you, and we need you. And Sincere wishes on your work. Thanks very much this morning.